Now, it's just uh, a few hours, uh, barely a day to Christmas. One would have thought that by now, uh, political activities in Nigeria will be winding down, but it, it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, if political activities wind down in Nigeria, one should be surprised. And over the past few weeks, there has been tension in Rivers over the feud between Simina Lai Fubara, governor of Rivers State, and Uyesam Uwike, um, his predecessor. In the wake of this crisis, the Rivers House of Assembly commenced impeachment proceedings against Fubara. The governor's lawyer list kicked against the impeachment moves. And welcome to Standpoint. I am Precious Amayo. After 27 lawmakers defected from the People's Democratic Party, PDP, to the All Progressives Congress, APC, uh, subsequently, Edison here, factional speaker of the Rivers Assembly, declared the seats of the lawmakers who defected vacant. However, following President Tinubu's intervention on Monday, Governor Fubara and Uyesom Wike agreed to, an, uh, to end the feud between them. In the eight-point resolution signed by the governor, the FCT minister and other uh, Rivers stakeholders, it was agreed that all impeachment proceedings against the governor should be dropped immediately. They also agreed that Mati and Amewule um, should be recognized as speakers, while the 27 lawmakers who defected should be taken back as members of the assembly. But this has now generated a lot of reactions from Nigerians. Joining me to talk about this is a former media aide to President Gulog, Jonathan Reno Omokri. Now, later on the show, we will also have Bedford Berefa uh, Benjamin, a member from Ijo Youth Council, who will also be speaking with us. But let's speak with, um, let's speak with Reno first. Reno, good to have you join us. Thank you for having me. So we'll look at these resolutions first of all. But some people have said, look, um, the end should justify the means. But some say, look, if the means is not constitutional, then there is a problem. I want to get to your reaction to um, how this, this crisis in River State has been resolved or the intervention by the president. Well, if you look at what's been said in the media, a lot of people have been putting uh, some blame on the National Security Advisor, and that's because Nigerians, by and large, don't understand uh, the role of a National Security Advisor because of our long years of uh, very a harsh military rule, and even when we got into democracy, we've had uh, former President Olusha Gwabasanjo and Buhari, who have a military uh, background. The job of a national security advisor is not to react to security threats. It's actually to be proactive and to prevent them from happening. And if you look at Nigeria's history with the Niger Delta, when you had militancy, it actually almost collapsed our economy. And the militancy in the Niger Delta began in River State and then also went into Bayosa State. So when you have a crisis of that nature in a state like River State, you want to be very careful. So you want to do everything that you can to bring peace. And that's why they got the people together and uh, they made some gestures to bring about peace. If you see in the United States, that's the same with the National Security Advisor. It is not just a military position. It's actually a military and a political position. Now, having said that, let's go into the nitty-gritty of the agreement. Now, you had a case whereby impeachment proceedings were being considered against the governor, and the governor was pushing back. If you have that kind of situation and you can bring everybody together and you can reach an agreement that is, well, not perfect, but at least it's a compromise. I mean, that is a win-win situation. Obviously, you know, some people have gone back. It's just like what happened in 1966, 1967, when eventually there was a crisis in Nigeria and General, or then Lieutenant Colonel Gowan and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku went to Aburi. By the time they returned, there were actors in Nigeria who were telling them, look, you have to repudiate the agreement that you had. And it led to a civil war. What's happened is that they had an agreement at Asuro, which was a pretty good um, agreement for both sides. But then the, uh, the governor has gone back to River State. And then there are some people who probably, maybe they feel that their own interests, personal interests, not the state's interests, their own personal interests are being, uh, when I say threatened, and they're now encouraging the governor to violate the agreement. Listen, it wasn't a perfect agreement, but at least it was an attempt to bring peace. And if both sides can adhere to the resolutions reached, I think there's going to be peace in River State. Mm. So two issues you raised. Um, one of them, you talked about how um, this is, of course, this is a security crisis and the president stepped in to resolve it. Um, and you also mentioned um, how the resolution itself. But I want to start with the issue of the president stepping in to find a solution quickly. Some would say, look, this issue was already in court and was going to re be resolved uh, one way or the other, and that perhaps the presidential should have waited for that to, uh, for the court to re to resolve it. And I want you to react to that. 
Well, it was human beings who took the case to court, and then it's the same human beings who took the case to court that went before the president. So, I mean, in a situation where you have people reaching an out-of-court settlement, I mean, it should be in the best interest of everybody. If you have a court case, that's a last, that's a last ditch scenario. But then when you're able to bring the people, because, I mean, at the end of the day, nobody really knows. A court case is like a war. Nobody really knows who's going to win a war. So what the president did and what his national security advisor did by bringing the uh, Jamaatis personnel together to try to reach an out-of-court settlement, I think it's quite good. It's happened in the United Kingdom. It's happened in the United States. You know, where you bring people together, not just even within the United States, even when you have countries in the Middle East. For example, President Carter, he was able to get President Anwar Sadat of Egypt and then with the um, Israeli Prime Minister together at the Camp David Accord, and they reached an agreement, and that agreement ended the state of war between Egypt and Israel. So we have precedent for that, both in international politics and then intranational politics and then in domestic politics. So people who are having that kind of thought, again, like I said, some people, uh, you got to understand, River State is a pretty unique state. It's not like a state uh, states in, let's say, the Southwest. So if you look at Nigeria, if you look at the dynamics of power in Nigeria, the Southwest, they have a conservative culture to guide them. If you look at the North, they have a conservative religion to guide them. In the South-South, and especially in River State, they have neither. So what you have, you have a lot of ego playing in a place like that. That's why if you look at the history of River State, 24 years we've had democracy. Not one governor has been in good relations with his preceding governor. So you had First of all, you had uh, uh, Mr. Peter Audley, and then he handed over to Omeya, who was removed, and then you had Amechi. Amechi wasn't on good terms with Peter Audley. Amechi left and was succeeded by Inyes Onwike. Inyes Onwike wasn't on good terms with Amechi. And then now you got Simi Fubara. Obviously, the same thing is happening. So the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. If you see what's been happening in River State, and you are a prudent president, you don't want to repeat of that, it's best for you to bring people and say, OK, yes, I know this case is in court, but can you agree to this? Can you agree to that? And you get a little good out. Mm. And you raise very interesting points about you know the history of governance in River State. I'll get to that shortly, because some people think, look, that is at the heart of this very issue. But I want to go back to um, what you said earlier about the resolution. Some would say that, look, when you look at this resolution, um, it's just I, I, item two, which is uh, which talks about the um, all impeachment proceedings initiated against the governor of River State um, House of Assembly. Sorry, against the governor of River State by the River State House of Assembly should be dropped immediately. Now, that's the only thing that seems to be beneficial to the governor. For you, when you look at this re res resolution, is it a win-win situation for all parties? I think it's a win-win situation for all parties because you had a status quo before and you had a breach of that status quo. What the resolution is saying is that let's get back to the status quo. And what was the status quo before? You had a House of Assembly that was uh, working on its own and you had the governor. And so if the two parts of the, or I would say the two arms, the third arm is the judiciary, obviously, and you know there was some challenge there. I think the governor tried to do one or two things with um, some persons in the judiciary. But if you can have the two arms of government, the legislature and the executive, going back to the status quo, then it benefits everybody. You got to understand something there. You know, Wiki in years on Wiki is in Abuja. In years on Wiki right now, yeah, he might be pulling the strings, but at the end of the day, the governor is in charge in his state. So. If I were in your song weekend, what I would do is I would abide by that agreement. If I were the governor, I would abide by the agreement. And then you can pick up the mantle, you can pick up the gauntlet, and then go back to war again in 2027 when there is an ele another election around the corner. But to be in a state of perpetual uh, electioneering, perpetual crisis for four years, it's not going to be in the interest of both the governor and his or Wiki, as well as the people of River State. There has to be a resolution of that crisis. Mm. But it would seem as though this intervention only resolves um, one half of the issue. And when you consider that, that the state assembly is still in crisis mode and, and the, the, the court cases, the PDP is saying that they are going to institute a case against those 27 uh, defecting lawmakers. So it doesn't look like this issue has actually been resolved. Well, here's the thing, you know, what the agreement said is that all cases that were filed by all the people, all the parties to the agreement, and in this case, all the parties to the agreement are the governor, 
the Minister of the FCC, and then the House of Assembly members. In River State, the governor is statutorily the head of the party. If you look at that, it's just like, for instance, now in Nigeria, in the All Progressive Congress, the president of Nigeria is the head of the party. It doesn't matter if somebody elsewhere is masquerading as maybe national leader or maybe you have a, a titular role as chairman. Once you have a president in place, he is the head of the party nationwide. The same thing in the state. Once you have a governor of the party in place, then he becomes the head of that party. So if the governor is willing, then the governor can put pressure to bear on the state PDP to withdraw all cases to the in court. The only way that the state is going to go, that the state PDP is going to want to continue to go to court is if the governor is not in league with them. And that's what I've said, that if you look at the agreement, it goes back to the status quo. It's in the governor's best interest, as well as the minister of the FCT, to reach a situation whereby they go back to the status quo, and then if they cannot find any permanent solution, then they can... Um, let's say reignite this war in 2027, but to go for four years in a state of crisis, in a state of electionary mode, it's not going to be good for the mental health of both people involved. It's not also going to be good for the development of the state. What about the PDP at the national level? If they decide to um, take, take this particular case to court, especially against the 27 defecting lawmakers? Yeah, but that's the thing, you know, if you have the PDP at the national level, I mean, they can't, the PDP at the national level on its own, they are not going to go to court. They have to go to court through the PDP at the state level. So you can't have, for instance, now, you can't have the PDP at the national level taking the lawmakers to court. They, they're not going to have the loci. So, in, in, I mean, in law, you have something called the local, local, side, local standard. So they do not have the local. They have to go through the state uh, chapter of the party. And if the state chapter of the party is saying, OK, we're not going to go to court, we're going to withdraw this case from court, then, I mean, there's nothing that the uh, national PDP can do. Look, I'm going to say this here. The PDP ought to have stepped in even before the president stepped in. If I were the PDP national chairman, I mean, I would have convened maybe like an elders council or a national working co uh, committee uh, council to go to River State to try to bring uh, some peace. I mean, if you look at River State, River State is surrounded by PDP states. You know, to one side, you've got Bielsa, who has a PDP governor, and then you also have a Quibom, which has a PDP governor. These states, their governors, even if the PDP on its own at the national level or the state level did not intervene, they could have intervened. Because because they failed to intervene, nature abhors a vacuum. The president has stepped in. So at the end of the day, what we want is peace. And then if the peace can hold until the next election, and then after that, you see, if you look at history, look at Lagos State, the current president had an issue with Ambody, who was a governor that he brought. But he did not try to, uh, would I say, um, shorten the governor's tenure. He allowed the governor finished his uh, tenure. And then when it was time for re-election, he ensured with the party in the state that the governor did not come back. That is what they have to do. Wait until 2027, and then they can flex their muscles then. Mm. You know, people have asked uh, or talked about the weaker factor within the PDP and why it's difficult for the PDP to address. Um, he almost seeming as though, because he, he has not left the party. He hasn't said he has left or he has moved to any other party. Um, it's almost as though one person is now bigger than um, the entire party. Um, what exactly is going on in that particular regard? Why is it difficult for the P P PDP um, to address the, the weaker factor in the party? Well, you have to understand, for the PDP, Wiki is like uh, a bull in a China shop. It's like a bull in a China shop. Um, you're probably not going to like what I'm going to say about uh, Inez on Wiki. Inez on Wiki is an egomaniac. You know, if you look at his personality, you know, he's very driven by ego, not by conscience. And people like that, you got to be careful. You cannot just descend to their level and then begin to fight them like that. No, you've got to use wisdom, you've got to use strategy, you've got to use tactics. So what is happening is that the man has not said that he has left the party or is going to, I mean, he's leaving the party. The PDP has to wait for him to make a stand, to take a stand. If he leaves, then okay, good, good riddance. If he decides to stay in the party and doesn't leave the party, then they have to find a way to endure him because what cannot be avoided must be endured. If you go on a frontal attack with him, 
you know, he has a lot of residual power in River State to, will I say, just bring about some crisis. People like Wiki are not very good builders, but they are very good destroyers. You got to understand that. I'm going to say that one more time. People like Wiki are not very good builders. They're very good destroyers. So when you know that that's the case, then you got to be careful. What can the man do? He's no longer governor. You know, Wiki does not have a history of being loyal to people who are no longer in the position to help him politically. If you look at Wiki, he was uh, with Amechi, and then when he got what he wanted from Amechi, he ditched Amechi. And then he became in bed with uh, the impatient Jonathan. When he got what he wanted, despite their public uh, protestations that it's not, it's, it's not true, he actually ditched that relationship. So by the time Wiki has gotten what he wants from, um, let's say, President Bola Tinibu, he's going to do the same thing because the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Wiki is somebody that you manage until you put him very carefully and tactically in a position whereby he can but, do but Reno, the damage. If, if I may yeah. quickly comment, you are saying that Wiki is not a good builder. He's a destroyer, as you, as you have said. But some people will say, look, he was very instrumental um, to building the PDP into what it is today, whether it's through energy and resources. And so that is, he probably feel aggrieved not, not to have gotten that support, like he has, he has said over time. Shouldn't that also be um, what the PDP should have addressed to, looking at his contributions over time to the party to ensure that, look, it, it is not just about sanctioning him. It's also to, about settling the issues. Well, here's the thing. If you follow me on social media and if you follow my column, I have said before that the PDP made a mistake in not giving its uh, running mate ticket, the deputy ticket, to Inyesa Wiki. I said that. We should have made him the running mate to Waziri Atika Ubaka. I said that. But, you see, that is a, is, is a ship that has sailed. So we cannot be uh, going forward by looking backward. Look, it's happened. You know, we made that mistake. We didn't give him my ticket. But you are misquoting me. I didn't say that Wiki is not a builder. I said Wiki is a better destroyer than he is a builder. He can build. He was able to build the G5 into a formidable block within the People's Democratic Party. But what I'm saying is that the man is a better destroyer than he is a builder. Right now, he is in a position whereby he cannot do much building, but he can do much destruction. So that ship has sailed. The People's Democratic Party, I mean, this is a man who wanted to be president. Failing that, he wanted to be vice president. Right now, the People's Democratic Party are not in a position to offer him the presidency or the vice presidency, except maybe in 2027, maybe they can offer him that uh, ticket. But for right now, you know, they have outlived their usefulness to him from his own point of view. I think he's seen that maybe he, there's some kind of uh, redemption that he can get with the APC and with President Bola Abetinibu. But if you look at the man's history, and you can only judge people's future by their history, this is a man who is not able to sustain loyalty to people when he feels that they are not in position to help mm -hmm. him politically. All right. So I want to tap into your experience as a former presidential spokesperson and one who has seen how governors runs at that very at the high, highest level. Um, because some people are insinuating that um, from, uh, the, the governor, rather, Fubara, may have signed this um, resolution out of duress, that he probably was coerced into signing this uh, agreement. You know, from, I mean, you would have seen things like this happen, um, maybe not publicized, during the time of uh, President Goodluck Jonathan. What do you think would have played out in this particular situation? Do you think that he would have been under duress in signing that resolution? That's not true. I mean, I, I understand. Like I told you, I'm giving you the history of uh, River State. River State is one of the most ethnically diverse states in Nigeria. A lot of people are surprised to learn that there are over 45 ethnic groups in River State. You hear of Andoni and you hear of Indoni and you think they're the same. No, they're different. So there is very, um, there is, the uniting force in River State is not like maybe in a place in any of the six southwestern states. So where you have, okay, there are various um, uh, subgroups of Yoruba, but they also assume themselves under that Yoruba identity. In River State, it's not like that. So, I mean, when you have that, you're going to be having people who are just going to be coming with their various agenda. I was a presidential spokesman. Everything that is done in the presidential villa is recorded. It's actually recorded, audio and camera. The governor could not have been placed under duress because it was being recorded. At the end of the day, if the presidency will want to put to shame those people making this allegation, they just released the video. You know, these people were brought together at the presidential villa. The president came in, the president brought in uh, the both parties and said, okay, look, how can we have a resolution? From what I understand, you know, they tabled out uh, some certain, uh, would I say, uh, um, 
uh, agendas that might resolve this, the situation on the ground, and both parties signed. There was no duress. Like I told you, this is again like deja vu. What happened in 1967 after Lieutenant Colonel Gowon and Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku went to Aburi, and the Ghanaian leader helped them to sign an agreement, which they called the Aburi Accord. When they got back home, people who felt threatened by that agreement began to work on the minds of Gowon and Ojuku, and eventually that agreement collapsed. So what happened is that they signed a freely, uh, would I say, a, a free will agreement at the presidential villa. They went back to their various parties, they went back to their various states, their various situations, and then people there you know, on the ground have looked at it and said, no, maybe this does not really favor me. Not the governor, not the state, but me. And then they began whispering in the ears of the governor, and that's how the agreement, I mean, uh, would that be this scenario that the governor was... Uh, Please under the US to sign the agreement. It's not true. And the governor himself has said it's not true. The, through his own commissioner, he has said it's not true. And the reason why the governor will say it's not true is because he knows that the whole thing would have been video recorded. Mm. And I, I just want to ask, because I've, I've listened to lawyers on this matter over and over again. And some have said, look, this agreement does not have the force of the law. Um, do you see your parties abiding by this resolution? Or, and what happens if um, Governor Fubara comes under pressure? and decide not to follow through with this resolution? River State is a state whereby the violence take it by force. I mean, if you, excuse me, using that scriptural language. So you have people in River State who, some of them have standing armies, you know, in a, in a nationality, they have a standing army. Some of them have that. So when these kinds of people begin to whisper to the governor or to talk to the governor in private, I mean, anything can happen. What I would recommend to the administration of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu is that, look, they should get back to the governor and say, okay, you signed this agreement, um, a free will agreement. Are you now not happy with it? If you're not happy with it, can you tell us behind the scenes, the press is not here, what parts of this agreement you're not happy with so that maybe we can talk to the other dramatic person, in this case, yes, on weekend, and see if he can bend over backwards to accommodate you. Because if you allow river states to degenerate and this crisis to escalate, it can really affect affect Nigeria's oil production output. It will spread. There's going to be a contagious effect to states like Bielsa and Delta, possibly not Aquaibon, because Aquaibon doesn't have a restive nature. And by the time you have that, you know, you go, look, don't forget that Nigeria was instrumental to the global economic recession of 2007, 2008, because of the crisis in the Niger Delta. We cannot afford a repeat of that, especially right now, when our economy, you know, is just beginning to come out of the doldrums that it was put by the Buhari administration. And I wanted to ask you, because I want to go back to what you said earlier about, well, you know, I said I was going to re revisit it, the history of governance in um, River State. And some have said that, look, this particular resolution sets a bad precedent in that regard, when um, it, it looks like, it, as they have said, you're siding with the predecessor over the, over the successor. And so you are not giving um, the successor the freedom and liberty to govern as, as issued. And so I wanted to ask you about that, how to address that particular issue once and for all, if it's, if it's even possible to address it in the first place in River State? Look, Nigerians tend to be very emotive people, and because of that, it's very easy to excite Nigerians. And it's not just Nigerians. Sub-Saharan black Africans uh, tend to be like that. You know, Maybe it's going to change by the time education permits down to the grassroots to a larger level. But for now, it's like that. Look, political godfatherism, or what some people might even call mentorship, exists in every human institution. It exists in every human institution. If you look at, let's say, religion, for instance, you know, if you look at someone like Bishop Oyedepo, he knelt down before Pastor Adeboya. Pastor Adeboya prayed for him and his wife. If you look at banks, you have situations whereby people like Tony Elumelu have people that they've mentored in the banking sector. If you look at maybe uh, something like sports, you have people, recently, um, I think it was Osime, Victor Osime, he gave tribute to one of the older egos that, look, this man mentored me and brought me to the point where I am. So there's no in entertainment. You have the same thing. You have uh, right now one of the biggest Nigerian stars is Whiskey. Whiskey did say that he was mentored by Banky W to get to the level that he is. So in politics, you have the same thing. If you look, a mentor or a political godfather that shortens the, different, the distance between you and success. If you want to go on your own, it's going to be very difficult for you. It is possible, but it's most unlikely that you're going to be successful. 
So political God for that reason, whether in business you call it mentorship, or whether in, uh, uh, would I say, in, in the music industry, whether you call it, even in crime, I mean, even in crime, you know, what people, in, in the mafia, in uh, Yahoo, Yahoo, and forward, and which are evil things, which are, we don't want in society, there is still that relationship there. So when Nigerians begin to say, no, we will be going to kill political God for that reason, who was the political godfather of Muhammad Dubuari? Muhammad Dubuari would not have gotten to the position of presidency if not for Bola Ahmed Tinubu. So it is a fact of life. If you look at even in scripture, for example, if you look at even in scripture, there was, a, would I say, that kind of mentorship relationship. You had Elijah and you had Elisha. You had Saul and you had Samuel. So it is a fact of life. And people have to understand that. Now, the only way that we can really, uh, would I say, um, resolve these kinds of crises is if we can look at a loci where it works very well, and that is the Southwest. In the Southwest, like I said earlier, because they have a conservative culture to guide them, they're able to work with this, whereby humility is not, is not seen as stupidity. Now, when you have a political godfather, you know, a political godfather, I mean, also, you do not have to be overbearing. You have to understand that, okay, look, I've Absolutely, done my part, you, you just, you, sorry to jump in, because that's where I was going to go next. That again, first of all, humility from the one who has been en enabled, but the enabler also has to give the one who has been enabled um, the breathing space to govern, which is where the problem usually is, when you want to be the one who enforces, you know, all of the that. rules and regulations in the state. I was coming to that. You see, that's why I said that, you know, in River State, they, they, don't, they don't have a conservative religion to guide them in that regard, or a conservative culture to guide them in that, in that regard. So they've got to learn from a local like the Southwest, where it works perfectly well. Somebody like Inyes Onwike, Inyes Onwike is a person who is, I think he's about 56 years old. I don't think that you, you can teach him new tricks. He's, he's a person that is driven by ego. If you see Inyes Onwike having an interview with journalists, he doesn't even allow journalists to talk. He wants to dominate them. That is his personality. It's his nature. So if you have such a person, like I said before, you know, you have to, he's a bull in a china shop, you have to manage him until he's, he, he, he's in a position whereby he can cause the least damage. And that's what the governor should have done. You know, the governor, I mean, I mean the governor is not uh, unfamiliar with Inez yes, Onwike's uh, personality. He worked with him for, I mean, for, uh, let's say, a number of years. So he knew the kind of person he was getting involved with. He should have, in my own case, you know, tried to, would I say, adopt a more um, reconciliatory um, approach to this. Look, if you want to, um, if you want to, turn the ship, you have two options available to you. You can turn the ship abruptly, in which case you could break the rudder, or you can turn the ship gently, 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 until you have it going in the direction that you want it to go. Or Lucian Gobasanjo, another person from the Southwest, he was brought in package by General Babagina and Abdul Salami Abubakar. And this was a man that was very gentle in taking power from the bloc that gave him power. And by 2007, he was the most influential black African politician in the whole world. So they have to learn from where this model has worked best, which is the Southwest. And failure to do that, there's always going to be crisis in River State. Like I said, you have never had a situation in River State whereby a succeeding governor is having good relations with a preceding governor. They have to learn from the Southwest. Otherwise, that state would perpetually be in crisis. So I am pressed for time, and I have so many questions to ask you. I know you're a lawyer as well, and I wanted to ask you about, you know, the four. Um, there's, because there's that provision in the resolution that, say, that says, you know, that budget should be represented to uh, a, a house, um, the House of Assembly, when it's rightly constituted. Um, but, and people are wondering if it if forms a quorum or not. But I also know that um, you, you, one of your strengths is, is also, you know, the economy. And I wanted to talk to you about the Naira. And I think I will just stay on the Naira. Um, when you look at what's happening, the Naira to the dollar, it is biting really hard on people. Things are, the prices of things are increasing every other day, especially in this season now that, you know, it's Christmas and New Year. What should we do or what should the government be doing now um, to, to, just in general language, um, if I will use the word help in that, in, in that language, um, the Naira, get back to at least when it was 700 or 750 against the dollar? Well, what we have to do right now is the former administration, the previous administration, Muhammad Buhari's administration, made some very terrible mistakes. 
You know, they should have floated the Naira. They didn't float the Naira, and they kept on spending $1.5 billion every month defending the Naira. Now, this administration has taken the right steps. It's taken the right steps to float the Naira. However, the president has to be more assertive. I know right now he has a, a governor of the central bank in place, and probably he wants to give them independence, but he's got to be more assertive. You, as the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, I mean, you do not take directives from the president, but you take guidance. You can take guidance from the president. If I were the president, I would have called the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria and said, look, you have to deny Forex or foreign exchange or any kind of, um, let's say, license to any government agency that wants to patronize a foreign good and, or service over a Nigerian goods or service. Take, for instance, the National Assembly going to buy those uh, SUVs um, from out of the country. Look, if I were the president, I would have put pressure on the Central Bank of Nigeria to make it impossible, not cooperate with them. When we begin to patronize made in Nigeria goods and services, then we're going to see the Naira, because right now the Naira is being floated. The laws of demand and supply are solely responsible for the value of Naira. So by the time we begin to change our consumption habits, then we're not going to see the kind of movement in the Naira that we want to see. And the citizenry, the people, you know, for, if, for this kind of, uh, let's say, behavior to trickle down, they want to see it in their government. When you tell the people of Nigeria to buy made in Nigeria goods and they are seeing the National Assembly spend so much money buying foreign goods, it's not going to encourage them. The president failed in that regard as far as I'm concerned, and it's something that he can correct. Because the National Assembly, these are people, you do not have sufficient patriotism in the National Assembly for this kind of, uh, when I say, pro-Nigeria stance to take place. You've got, um, I mean, options in Nigeria. You've got uh, Innocent. They could have bought those vehicles from Innocent. Now, that is the part of the government. For the people of Nigeria, the people of Nigeria are, would I say, we do not want to do the right things. We want to eat our cake and have it. Currently in Nigeria, 76.7 .7 million people use MTN. Another 45 million people use Airtel. You cannot have 130 million Nigerians spending $20 million every day that is going to South Africa and India, and just you want the Naira to appreciate. It cannot happen. There's an option. Why can't you use glue? If you have those 130 million Nigerians using glue, if they start using glue tomorrow, I'm telling you, immediately it's going to have a positive impact on the value of the Naira. The value of the Naira is just going to explode immediately. So you see, even if you have Nigerians, even in their dressing habits, Nigerians, you know, we like to wear Balenciaga, Louis Vuitton, you know, Gucci. Now, wealthy Nigerians, elite Nigerians should begin to change their consumption habits from the president to the governors to the Senate president to um, legislators. Legislators, start dressing Nigerian, you know, spend your money in Nigeria. That's going to make the Naira improve. And then finally, I'm going to say this also. I mean, this is very important. We need to have a policy in place whereby there is some kind of tax, uh, will I say punitive tax, for government institutions and the private sector that patronize uh, um, foreign goods and services. For instance, if you are a minister or a member of the ministries, departments, and agencies, and you are flying to a route that uh, airpiece can fly, you know, they, they actually have a planes going that route, but you choose to fly British Airways, then you should be able, you should be made to pay a tax. Whether you're in the private sector or in the public sector, you should be made to pay a tax. We should patronize made in Nigeria goods and services, and that's the only way that NARA can appreciate. Mm -hmm. And, and many people will say, look, they agree with you because when you watch American movies, there is a, there's this deliberate, you know, um, this de deliberate intent or this is intention is very intentional when they position their brands. You hardly find them use phones in, in, in their movies that are not made in America or cars that are not made in America. Very intentional. But some people will also say, look, for network, for example, I'm going to use the one that provides the best service for me. And I'm going to use the one that has the best network in my area. It's not necessarily about whether it's a Nigerian brand or not. It's just what works where I live at the moment and what you know gives offers me the best services in terms of data and calls. And that's probably how it works. And so if we have to patronize or patronize Nigerian made in Nigerian product products, they have to be an upscaling. And so where should that come from? Is it those who are manufacturing or, or, or these goods and services or from the government enabling them to thrive? 
That's why I said that Nigerians want to eat their cake and have it. The only way that a company provides better goods and services is by patronage. So by the time you begin to patronize them more, their revenue increases and they're able to plow back their revenue and profit to have better products and better services. So you have to have sacrifice. You've got to have people saying, okay, we're going to sacrifice. If you look at India, India had a company called Tata. Tata was a very, will I say, um, poor uh, in, in terms of service delivery. You know, if you look at what they call keke in Nigeria, they call keke marwa and all of that. That's what Tata used to do. But Indians deliberately said, okay, you, you know what? We've got better alternatives from the West, but we're going to patronize Tata. That's patriotism. We're going to patronize Tata. And then eventually Tata became so good that now Tata is now the number one provider of railway services in the United Kingdom, not India, in the United Kingdom. Tata is so good that when India... Um, three months ago, when they landed a spacecraft in the moon, Tata was part of the people that provided the technical expertise. So I know that GLOW probably might not be as good as MTN and Airtel, but as a Nigerian, if you love Nigeria, if you love the Naira, you want the Naira to appreciate, then you've got to make that, look at what I'm using, sacrifice. You've got to make that sacrifice. Without sacrifice, there's not going to be progress. I know that maybe Toyota and um, Nissan might make better vehicles than Innocent, but you've got to sacrifice and patronize Innocent. Don't say to yourself that, oh, he's one Igbo man. Even if he's an Igbo man, buy Igbo made. I'm very upset. Uh, am I still there? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, you are. You are. Yeah, I'm very upset when I watched um, NAFDAQ and then they caught some people. Uh, I think they were making uh, fake uh, wines and then they were making some fake pharmaceuticals and then they arrested them, they threw them in jail. That is not the way a nation grows. Those people, what you do is that you get them. And you say, okay, look, you are able to make fake wines, you're able to make fake pharmaceutical grade uh, medicine. What do you need to create a genuine one, an authentic one? Is it that maybe you need training so that you know how to register a company, you know how to register mm -hmm. a patent? And then that's how you begin to help your own, will I say, local people build your own mm -hmm. industrial complex. Thank you so much, Ren. Always a pleasure speaking with you. I hope Nigerians are listening and we begin to patronize made in Nigerian products. Um, former presidential spokesman um, for former president, good luck, Jonathan, Ren Mokri. Thank you so much for talking to us. And thank you for having me. God bless you.